Okay, we're going to be reading Psalm 119 this morning, Psalm 119. So this is the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. And I'm going to be preaching today on the topic of Psalm 119. Psalm 119, Aleph. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall, when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I've just highlighted in green some of my favourite uh, verses in Psalm 119. I will keep thy statutes, O oh, forsake me not utterly. Beth, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. When my lips have, with my lips have I declared all the ju judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Gimel. Deal bountifully with thy servant that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counsellors. Daleth. My soul cleaveth unto the dust, quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, and thou heardest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. He, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding. I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way. Establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear. Turn away my reproach which I fear for thy judgments are good. Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Vow, let thy mercies Come also unto me, O Lord, even thy salvation according to thy word. So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. So shall I keep thy law continually for ever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings, and will not be ashamed and i will delight myself in thy commandments which i have loved my hands also will i lift up unto thy commandments which i have loved and i will meditate in thy statutes zane remember the word unto thy servant un upon which thou hast caused me to hope this is my comfort in my affliction for thy word hath quickened me the proud have had me greatly in derision 
yet have I not declined from thy law. I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night, and have kept thy law. This I had because I kept thy precepts. Cheth. Thou also, th thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. I entreated thy favour with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The bands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. At midnight I will rise to give thee thanks, to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. Teth. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thou art good, and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I will delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Jod. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and that thou in faithfulness hath, hast afflicted me. Let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness be for my comfort, according to thy word, unto thy servant. Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. Calf. My soul fainteth for thy salvation, for I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle in the smoke, yet do I not forget thy statutes. How many are the days of thy servant? When wilt thou execute judgment upon on them that persecute me? The proud have digged pits for me, which are not after thy law. All thy commandments are faithful. They, pers they persecute me wrongfully. Help thou me. They had almost consumed me upon earth, but I forsook not thy precepts. Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Lamed. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue this day according to thine ordinances, for all are thy servants. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should have perished in mine affliction. I will never forget thy precepts, for, for will, with them thou hast quickened me. I am thine, save me, for I have for I have sought thy precepts. The wicked have waited for me to destroy me, but I consider thy testimonies. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. Mem. O Lord, O how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hath made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way none thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path 
I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according unto thy word. Accept, I beseech thee, the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I erred not from thy precepts. Thy testimonies have I taken as an heritage forever, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even unto the end. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield, I hope in thy word. Depart from me, evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according unto thy word, <coughs> that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. Thou hast trodden down all them that err from thy statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross, therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. Aeem, I have done judgment and justice, leave me not to mine oppressors. Be surety for thy servant, for good, let not the proud oppress me. Mine eyes fail for thy salvation, and for the word of thy righteousness, deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy, and teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant, give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Uh, pay, 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 P, or pay. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light, and giveth understanding unto the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. Look thou upon me, and be merciful unto me, as thou usest to do unto those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of water run down mine eyes, because they keep not thy law. To Zadi. Righteous art thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. Thy testimonies thou hast had, thou hast commanded, are righteous and very faithful. My zeal hath consumed me, because mine enemies have forgotten thy words. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. I am small and despised, yet do not I forget thy precepts. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me, yet thy commandments are my delights. The righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. Cough. I cried with my whole heart. Hear me, O Lord, I will keep thy statutes. I cried unto thee, save me and I shall keep thy testimonies. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried. I hoped in thy word. <coughs> Mine eyes... Prevent the night watches, that I might meditate in thy word. Keep my, keep, hear my voice according unto thy loving kindness, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgment. They draw nigh that follow after mischief. They are far from the law. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. Concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Resh, consider mine affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. Plead my cause and deliver me. Quicken me according to thy word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. Many are my persecutors and mine enemies, yet do I not decline from thy testimonies. I beheld the transgressors, transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. Consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Shin. 
Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in awe of thy word. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgment. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and have done and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee. Tell, let my cry come near before thee, O Lord. Give me understanding according to thy word. Let my supplication come before thee. Deliver me according to thy word. My lips shall utter praise when thou hast taught me thy statutes. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy soul is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise thee, and let thy judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek thy servant, for I do not forget thy commandments. All right, so that was a long chapter. That's the longest chapter in the Bible. Um, so, you know, if you read any other chapter, it'll take less time than that. But I always find it interesting that the longest, you know, uh, I guess the biggest book in the Bible is a song book. So it tells you the emphasis in song that God places on song. But the longest chapter in the longest book of the Bible, which is Psalms, is Psalm 119. And if you didn't catch it as we were reading through it, the theme throughout Psalm 119 is what? God's Word. God's Word. So the longest chapter in the Bible is a chapter that is verse after verse. It's almost in every verse. I think there's a couple of verses that don't mention God's Word because it's sort of like a continuation of a sentence or some other thought. But almost every verse in Psalm 119 is talking about God's Word. That should show you the importance of God's Word in your life. I mean, think about how much he's saying, like, I seek his Word. I'm seeking to understand his Word. Uh, you know, every time during the day, I'm meditating on his Word. I'm trying to do his Word. You know, uh, his Word is what comforts me. His Word is what helps me get through the day. Is, does the Word seem like something you just possess and you never really read? You never really dwell on. It, it should be part of your everyday life. That's why when the Bible says we teach it to our children, it's when you get up, it's when you sit down, it's when you walk by the way. Because it should always be with you. The Bible shouldn't just be something that you hear on Sundays. And then throughout the week, it's never a part of your life. The Bible should be just something that is part of your very identity. It's part of who you are. It's part of who your family is. When you talk around the dinner table, when you talk with your husband or with your wife, when you're talking just a month in the day, is, is the Word of God just a part of who you are? Maybe it isn't enough of who you are. Why? Because you're not doing this. That's the title of my sermon this morning, is reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. Don't get confused with reading the Bible with hearing sermons about the Bible or hearing sermons on the Bible. That's not the same as reading the Bible. So the question today is, are you reading the Bible? You know, it doesn't specify how much to read the Bible. Are you reading it the most you can? Are you doing it at all? Because sometimes people don't read the Bible at all. And they just listen to sermons, they just come to church, and that's all they're learning. What's the problem with that? The problem with that is you can't learn everything just from sermons. You can't learn everything just from coming to something. Why? Because I'm not going to teach every single facet of the Bible. The Bible is quite a long book. You know, I'm going to be preaching maybe things that are relevant, things that are practical, things that are on my mind, things that I think are helpful. But there's a lot in the Bible that you're not going to hear through a sermon. And even when you're picking sermons, generally you're picking things that you like. Right? You're not just picking sermons where it's just beginning to end. And even when you listen to sermons that go through verse by verse, chapter and chapter, you'll notice that when people preach by chapter, verse by verse, they don't cover every verse. Because right? you don't cover every verse in detail when you're preaching chapter by chapter often. You'll just touch on certain things in there. So you need to be reading 
the Bible. And today I just want to encourage you and remind you, you know, if you've been falling by the wayside in your Bible reading, today's a reminder, hey, you need to pick it back up. You need to get back into it. You need to make it a daily habit of reading the Bible and getting through it, even those passages that you tend to stray away from. Right? Maybe there's passages in the Bible where it's like, oh man, these are difficult to read. These are difficult to understand. Those are the ones you've got to read more. It's like when I talk to Simon about soccer, you know, like sometimes in, in a sport, you know, you, you end up just using the foot that you're stronger with. I don't know, you got, maybe you don't know soccer, you know, but if you're right-handed or uh, right-footed, everything you do is with your right foot. And then what tends to happen is you, you don't want to use your left foot anymore because in practice, it's easier, you're better with your right foot. In a game, it's, you're better with your right foot. And then you, you tend to not start not using your left foot. But I was telling Simon, no, because you're not good with your left foot, you actually have to do it more. You have to use it more so that you can get used to using it. So you're not just a one-sided player. So it's the same in the Bible. That's ten, that tends to be what happens. You know, you get familiar with some books, and then those are the books you like to read. And you read them more and more and more, and you get familiar, more familiar with those, and you start to get less and less familiar with the ones you don't like. So that just means you've got to read the ones you don't like even more. Right? You've got to read them more so that you have a balance and you, you know every part of it just as well. And I mean, this is even in my own life. I mean, there are, even in my own life, there are books in the Bible that I'm less familiar with. And those are the ones that I struggle more to read through and to understand. And then those are the ones I need to read more of so that I get a full view of everything that is going on in the Bible. Now, the Bible, which in this church, we use the King James Bible. That's the Bible that you should be using in English. Which, which is the one that's translated accurately and is the most faithful. That's the one we use in this church. But what you have to understand is the Bible is not only the Word of God. Now, what do I mean by that? Let's look in John 1. Look at this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you see how the Word of God is not just the Word of God, because the Word of God is God. Now that's a really profound thought, that God somehow is also His Word. Now does that mean He's like the physical pages? You know, the, the ink? You know, that's why when people start worshipping the actual book, where they say, oh, don't put the book on the floor. You know, don't, don't throw the book around. You know, maybe that's just maybe the testimony, the perception of how you respect God's Word. But that book in and of itself is not God's Word. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that's just a book that contains the information that is God's Word. Same with this screen. If we say God's I mean, is God this projector screen and the light? No, no. He is those words. But this is what's profound. Is we don't really know how that works. That these words that can be translated into different languages, works in our heart, what we memorize, what we preach, that is not just words that God has spoken. That is actually God himself. And I, I don't know how that works, right? But this is what the Bible tells us. The Word was with God, so there's that separation there, but, and the Word was God. So what I want you to take from this is, how can you know God without knowing his Word? You can't know God without knowing His Word. And sometimes people think that. People think, oh, I'm going to church. Especially the charismatics, right? Go to church. Oh, man, I feel God. I have this relationship with God. And they have no idea what the Bible said. How do they read their Bible? They have no idea about doctrine. They have no, oh, you know, this is, oh, you don't have to worry about doctrine. It's just relationship with God, you know? But you can't have a relationship with God. You don't have a relationship with His Word. Why? Because the Word is God. You see, so if you want to have a relationship with God, you've got to have a relationship with the Word. How can you love God if you don't love His Word? See, do you say you love God? See, people say they love God. Man, I love God so much, and then they don't go to church. They love God so much, they don't read their Bible. You can't love God and not love His Word because God is the Word. So you, that can give you a gauge, Right? If you think you love God a lot, and yet you just despise reading His Word, you've got to reflect on yourself and go, man, do I really love God as much as I think I do? Because if I loved God, I would love His Word. <laughs> you know, it'd be like saying, I love somebody, but I just despise spending time with them. 
That's what it's like when you think you love God, but you despise spending time with his word because he's, God is the word. So there's a direct relationship between how much you love God and how much you love his word. There's a direct relationship with how much you know God and how much you know his word. Why? Because the word is God. And because the word is God, that's why the Bible is the foundation of everything we do and we believe. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. I'm just going to turn this off because I'm getting a bit hot. I don't know about you guys. You guys might be warm, but... I'm getting hot up here. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So this is why we believe we have all of the Bible. We have it all. There's no more revelation because at this point we can say he knows all the scripture and you can be through them, you can be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So how can you do all good works if you don't even know what all of them are? So that's why we believe all scripture is complete now. So all scripture is here. We have it. It's given by inspiration of God. What does that mean? That it's spoken by God. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we don't just have a book that is inspired in the sense people god spoke to people and then they were inspired by what god told them and write, wrote down things no the bible says holy men of god spake as they were moved by the holy ghost so yes while we recognize that god used men to pen down the bible god used men to speak the bible that was actually god speaking through them and that's that's one of the mysteries of the bible is how how does the bible contain even you know some of paul's opinions you know, quotes from people, and yet this is God's eternal word that he wanted to deliver to us. And not only is it what he said, but it is in fact him. That is something that is really profound that maybe only once we get to heaven, we'll get it. You know, we get to heaven and it's like, ah, that how, that's how it works. But right now it's like, I don't know, we'll have to just take it by faith that that's how it works. God just tells us, this is how it is. You just have to believe me that this is how it works. So the Bible is the foundation of everything we do and it's everything we need to live a good life. This is why I love how it's phrased this way. It's profitable for doctrine. It's going to teach you what is right. For reproof, it's going to teach you what is wrong. So you learn from the Bible what is right, what is wrong. For correction, how to make what is wrong right. And for instruction in righteousness, how, to make, how, do, you, how do you keep it right? See, so it's teaching you what is wrong, what is right, how to correct it, how to keep it right, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, like we say, the word is God. Obviously, you need the Bible to grow. Like, if you want to grow as a Christian and you're not reading your Bible, that's, you're not going to be able to grow. That's like wanting to grow without any food, wanting to grow without God. How are you going to grow in God without God? No, you need to be reading God's word, building that relationship with God, and you're building that relationship when you know him more. The more you know about the Bible, that is a direct measure of how well you know God. It's needed for growth. First Peter 2, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Luke 4, look at when Jesus was tempted. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So you see, you need every word of God to live, right? So that's why it's like we have to live by every word of God, and we have every word of God. If you want to start growing in your faith, you need to have every word of God and be studying it. Hebrews 5. Look at this, how the word is likened not only to milk, you know, desire desire the sincere milk of the word, but it's also likened to strong meat. For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So what is he referring to here when it comes to food? 
For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. So you see how it's talking about God's word, right? God's word feeding us, helping us to grow. For he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you see how it's the more you know it, not only that, but the more you use it. Right? So one level is learning God's word. The next level is actually doing God's word. But you see how God's word is likened to milk and to strong meat. What does that tell me? That tells me that no matter where you are in your Christian life, you need God's word. Yeah, you, you may not be a babe, you may not need milk, but you always need strong meat. So you never get to the point where you know enough Bible. You, know, you never get to the point where you don't need the Bible anymore. No, you always need to be learning the Bible. There's always things that could be feeding you from it. And yeah, maybe you're very familiar with a lot of the milk of the Word, and this is what happens sometimes in the Christian life, is they get familiar with all the milk of the Word and they think, hey, I'm pretty good. It's kind of like kids, right? They get to an age where they start learning a lot of things and then they think they know everything. That's the same in the spiritual life. People learn a lot of the fundamental doctrines. They learn a lot of basic things to understand. Yep, okay, I know how to dress. I know I should be going to church. I know it's so many. And then salvation. And then they think, I'm, I'm good. I know everything. No, but there's a lot in the Bible that is, very, that is strong meat. Stuff that gets you thinking. Stuff to figure out. Stuff to learn. And honestly, you know, if you, are, if you ever get to the point where you think you know enough, that, that's a very good indication that you know very little. <laughs> because I, I tell you what, the more you learn, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. If that makes sense. The more you learn and the more you, you grow in the faith, you realize how, how little you actually do know and you have so much more to learn. So there's never a point when you don't need the Bible. So make sure you're reading it. Make sure you're reading it as much as you can and reading it through. Let's go on. <clears throat> now, why is it important to read the Bible? Not only is it so that you're making sure you're getting a whole picture of what God is trying to teach us and what God has for us, but most important, one of the most important things is that it keeps you from false doctrine. You know, what a lot of new believers do, unfortunately, because it's easier, right? Obviously, it's easier to eat a prepared meal, right, when you listen to a sermon or whatnot, than it is to prepare your own meal, right? To go straight to the source, get the ingredients, and learn and feed yourself, right, rather than being fed. So what happens with new believers, unfortunately, and a lot of uh, young Christians, is rather than first having a priority of reading the Bible, learning it, knowing what it says, and then using that to judge what is being told to them or what is being taught to them, even in church, like what I'm teaching you, or what you're learning online, or this person that you're listening to and whatnot, they start finding sermons. That's the first thing they do, right? Because that's sort of what we're used to in this day and age. Listen to videos, so they're like, oh, they get saved, now they're learning things, they're going to look up some sermons, learn some things. They find this preacher, that preacher, and they start listening to a bunch of sermons. And that's, they're listening, they're learning a lot. The problem with that is when you're just listening to just somebody's opinions and teachings about the Bible, how do you even know what they're teaching you is right? Because, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to make a teaching sound right to people that don't know the truth. Why do you think prosperity gospel preachers are so successful? You know, because they can use verses out of context. They can go to the Old Testament and say you're going to be healthy, wealthy and wise if you do X, Y, if you're a believer. And man, it's, it's all out there. Right? They're quoting verses out of context, quoting all sorts of things without a full view of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Bible. And, and that's even what happens with salvation. You know, why do you think people have so many verses in order to prove work salvation? Because work salvation is in the Bible. In the sense that that's what the old covenant was. Was salvation by works. The problem is it's impossible. But it's there. There's verses there that'll say if you keep the you obey, you're gonna find mercy, if you turn away from your sins. So, well, it's there because that's what the old covenant was. But Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That's why it's there. People can use those verses, but if you don't compare it to the whole Bible, then you're gonna use them incorrectly, right? And now you're gonna be teaching a salvation that is by works that is impossible 
And that's the problem with works salvation. Not that there aren't verses there to say salvation is by works, it's that if you try that, you're not going to be saved. So reading your Bible keeps you from false doctrine because then now you're able to judge whether or not what you are learning is right. And so, sometimes it's really obvious where, you know, you know, people will listen to sometimes these prosperity gospel preachers and then they're quoting verses and what, and they're saying this is what the Bible says. And then you just go look it up. And, and sometimes they've changed the verse. Like they've, sometimes they've changed it to make it sound like something, or they've said it, and it's like not even said to us. You know, it's not even said to, like, you know, to believers. It's said to an individual in the Bible, and they're just taking that to, to apply it to everybody. So I don't think that is wise to do, and that's why it's important that we read the Bible, we have a good relationship with the Bible, because it's going to keep you from false doctrine. Let's look at three examples in Matthew 19, where people erred, because they did not know the scriptures. Matthew 19, this is an example when people come to Jesus and ask him about marriage and divorce. And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan and great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? So what do they mean there? They're saying, is it okay to divorce for any reason? And of course, it's not okay to divorce for any reason. So what is, how does Jesus respond? He said, and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? So you see how they're, where is the, the source of their error? That they're not reading God's word. That's why they believe something that is wrong. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now you don't have to get very far in the Bible to know that that's what God believes about marriage, because that's in Genesis 2. Right? So they, these guys that are coming to question Jesus, I mean, had they had read as far as that, just to Genesis 2, to know that God made them male and female and said, let no man put asunder, you know, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. But why were they erring? Because they had not read the scriptures. Right? Luke 6, here's another example. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. So this is on the Sabbath day, right? The Saturday, they're going through a cornfield and then the disciples plucked off ears of corn, rubbed them, and I guess there are certain corn types of corn that you can eat just from, you know, getting the husk off and start eating them. Um, now, isn't it, it's interesting here, if you know the law in the Old Testament, that... You know, you, you can actually take fruit off of a tree, of somebody's tree, and, and that's not stealing. Did you know that? So if somebody's got a fruit tree, and you just go by and you pluck an apple off of it and you eat it, that's not technically stealing, according to the Bible. I don't know if Australian law it is. It's only wrong if you go and take a vessel, you go take a basket and start harvesting their fruit. That's, that's when you've crossed the line. But that's why it's interesting here, they actually see an example of this where, you know, they're walking through a field and there's nothing wrong with them taking corn off the, off, off the fields and, and eating them, rubbing them in their hands. Now what are they doing here that they're being accused of? That they're doing it on the Sabbath day. So they're not, you're not meant to be obviously harvesting on the Sabbath day. But are they harvesting? No, they're not. Right? They're hungry, they need some food, so they just pluck some off to eat. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? What Jesus is. And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this? What is he saying there? It's like, you haven't even read this as, like, as much as this. Like, this is pretty basic things in the Old Testament when you read about David. Have you not read so much as this, what David did when he when himself wasn't hungered and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the sabbath now i don't know if you've ever thought about what this means and how, how this you tie this all together but remember in the old testament there, there are moral laws so there are things that are always wrong lying stealing 
But then there are temporary laws that were imposed on Israel at the time. The Sabbath is one of those things, right? So that's why the Sabbath is not inherently morally sinful. It's just something that was imposed on them for the time. Yeah, if they broke it at that time, it would have been a sin, but it's not inherently sinful. But also, these laws, people were applying incorrectly because they would, they would have a law like the Sabbath, which is, you know, you don't do work on the Sabbath, but then they would try and hold it so strictly that they would not even allow mercy. Like in another area, Jesus says, well, if your ox or ass falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, you know, you're going to say, oh, it's a Sabbath day, I can't you know, do any work, I can't touch my... No, you're going to have some mercy, right? And take your animal out of the pit, just like you can heal on the Sabbath. So it's the same here, that these guys are not, not breaking the Sabbath because they're not doing it for work, right? Even though they're doing the same act, the same act of plucking the fruit off the tree. They're saying, well, nobody is meant to be plucking fruit off the tree, but they're missing the point of it. The point of the Sabbath was, you know, you're meant to rest to focus on God and not do something of your own work. But here, it's, they're not doing something of their own work. They're plucking it because they're hungry and they need something to eat. So Jesus is trying to show them that there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of love and grace that is higher than just the strict act of what is being said here because there is a purpose of why the Sabbath was implemented and that's why it's important, not just the act itself. So what he's saying, what he's giving them as an example in this case, because I didn't want to read through the whole chapter, what he's giving as an example in this case is the fact that David, when he was hungry, went and ate the showbread. Now, what was that? So there was when they would offer sacrifices to God and whatnot, there was a table in the first tabernacle. Because you remember there was two tabernacles, the first one, and then the second one after the veil, which was the holiest of all, which the high priest, if you remember when we went through Hebrews, he went in once a year with blood, right? So in that first tabernacle, there was a table with showbread on it. So it was like, it was like sanctified bread that only the priests could eat, right? And nobody else was allowed to eat it. And I'm sure there would be a punishment if somebody just went in there and tried to eat it, right? So what is he saying here? Well, there, in this, if you don't know the story in the Old Testament, you know, David's on the run from Saul and he goes to Abiathar the priest and he's asking, is there anything to eat? And he's got, he's got nothing, but he says, but I've got the showbread, right? So the showbread in that, so, so Abiathar feeds David and his men that showbread, but they don't get in trouble for it. Why, why? Why was there no punishment? Because they were hungry. So it's not that, you know, it's like, it's like the, the Pharisees think, okay, if somebody's starving and they need food and you've got this food that's like sanctified food for God, that God wouldn't want you to use that food to feed somebody, right? So that's what he's saying here. Yeah, they, they you know, in, in, a, in a just carnal sense, they defiled the temple but what's more important than that and what overrides that is the fact that Abiathar showed mercy to the people and said, hey, yeah, eat this because you need food. Right? So this is what Jesus is teaching here. That, yeah, they're not applying those Old Testament laws that were imposed on them temporarily correctly because they're not having the love and the grace that also is underlying those commandments. It doesn't negate you know, mercy, justice, judgment and love. Now, why were they making this error? Like Jesus says, have you not read so much as this? So you see how it's important to know the Bible because people will bring up arguments, people will bring up thoughts that are false. And how are you going to know whether it's false when you're listening to somebody say something? How do you know it's false? How do you know they're teaching the right thing? Well, the only way you're going to know is if you look at the source yourself and see, hey, uh, is what they are teaching actually correct? Let's go on to the last example in Mark 12. It says here, Then come unto him the Sadducees, which, they, which say, There is no resurrection. And they ask him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die, and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife, and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. And the second took her and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise, and the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise up, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures, 
neither the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead, that they rise not. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. So again, you see here how people have false thoughts, false doctrine, and Jesus is correcting them, saying, why do you have this false doctrine? Because you don't know the scriptures, right? If you knew the scriptures, you would know that when we rise from the dead, we're not still married, right? They're just asking these questions because they're trying to negate the resurrection, right? So that's why Jesus says, don't you know that when we rise from the dead, we're not going to still be married. That's why marriage is still death to us part. You know, that's why when a husband is, is dead, she's free from the law to be married from another. That's why when, a, when there's a widow, her husband is dead, she can make decisions for herself now. And now she can make decisions because she no longer has that authority over her. But then he says, but as touching the dead, so not only is he correcting their wrong understanding of marriage, he's correcting their wrong understanding of the resurrection, saying, because the, the Sadducees are basically denying that people rise again from the dead. That's why they're asking this question. It's not because they believe people rise from the dead. They're trying to show Hey, this is how rising from the dead would be silly if somebody married, if a lady married some uh, seven different men, right? Who, whose wife is she going to be when, when they all rise again from the dead? So he's saying, no, they're not going to be married. And he says, second of all, if you don't think they rise from the dead, he's saying, well, why is God saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, if Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are dead? Because he's saying God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. So of course these people must be living somewhere, they must be risen somewhere in, in one day in order for God to be their God, right? If they're, if they're no longer existing. Ye therefore do greatly err. So that's why it's important. It's important that you read the Bible so that you know whether or not things are right. Look in Acts 17. People know the noble Bereans. Why? Because the Bereans, it says here, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Right? So we need to make sure we search the scriptures to make sure that what we are learning is right. So you don't even want to take what I say for granted, right? You need to even compare what I say to the scriptures because what I teach is not the final authority, right? What I teach is my, well, how I understand the Bible. But ultimately, whatever the Bible says, that's what is true, and we're trying our best to understand the Bible. Now, let's, uh, this is just uh, my second last point. But you know, it's so easy to take what you have for granted. Right, the fact that we just have access to God's word. You know, we don't, we don't have to fight for parchments. We're not persecuted for having it. There's not somebody trying to burn all the copies of our Bible, trying to get it censored. We have unlimited access to the Bible. Not only that, but we have tools today where we can just easily search it, find whatever passage we want. I mean, when you think of the Bereans, when they're searching the scriptures daily, they are literally, probably by candlelight, searching those scriptures daily. Right, scanning through them of the scriptures that they have. You know, for us, I mean, the, the, the searching of the scriptures daily, you can do in a second. Right? Just type in a word and find it. And yet, we have so much access to the word, and yet we take it for granted when we don't use it. Right, so what do we have? Let's look at a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians 2. We have the wisdom of God in the mind. Of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. I've always heard this verse used to talk about the things we get in heaven. Now, whilst I understand the things we get in heaven, you know, we haven't seen, we don't know. So it could apply there. 
But this is not really what that verse is talking about. This verse is talking about the wisdom of God that is revealed to us as believers and through his word. Because he says, God hath I not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Right? So how does God reveal things by his spirit unto us? Through the word of God. So the spirit speaks the word of God. He takes of Jesus and shows it unto us. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So just like our spirit is what how people know what we believe, the spirit of God is how we know the mind of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. So you see now it's referring to words, right? It's not just this feeling. There's these words that the Holy Spirit has given to us where we can get the wisdom of God, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned but he that is spiritual judgeth all things yet he himself is judged of no man for who hath known the mind of the lord that he may instruct him but we have the mind of christ and you realize that when you read the bible you are getting insight into the mind of god into the mind of that's a pretty profound thing when you think about it you know on, when you watch on YouTube, I don't know if you've seen the ads for this, um, this website uh, called Masterclass. Have you guys seen the ads for Masterclass? I don't know if you guys, oh, maybe not. Maybe, maybe it's just getting shown to me. <laughs> it's like targeted ads to me. But Masterclass is like, you know, just famous people, really like, well-known professionals doing like a tutorial and it's like really well done, you know, the video and everything. So if you think about it, like it's, it's very successful because if you think about it, not, you don't, not everyone gets to sit down and pick the brain of somebody famous or somebody that you really respect or somebody that has a lot of knowledge. Can you sit down and just ask them what to find out what's in their mind? So that's why this masterclass is almost like they get to put all this knowledge into this class and people want to learn from it. Well, where would you get Jesus' masterclass? Here. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if people want to learn what the world has to teach, what these famous people in the world have to teach, how much more so should we desire Jesus' masterclass? Where he came and he did, it's recorded down for us, but if you don't read it, I mean, you're not learning from it. You know, so people want to learn a masterclass from somebody in the world. And here we have the ability to learn from the master himself. And yet people do not take the time to read the Bible and learn from the mind of Christ. Ephesians 3, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, right? So this is like the wisdom that's given to Paul to give to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four in few words. Look at this. Whereby when ye read, when ye read, see, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. See, there are things that we can know today that back then they didn't know. Like the people in the Old Testament don't know all the things we know today, and today we take it for granted that we don't even read it. It's so easy to access, we don't even read it. But Paul says here, hey, you're going to understand these mysteries. Like even P Peter says about Paul, like people always, like they rest, you know, with things that are hard to be understood. Even Paul's epistles are hard to be understood. But Paul says, hey, I was given these revelations, but if you read, you're going to understand the knowledge in the mystery of Christ. If you read it, obviously through prayer and as well, you know, so, but you've got to read it. That's where it's got to start. If you don't read it at all, you'll never understand it. And prophets by the Spirit. 2 Peter 1. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. You see, the Bible is not just a made-up made fairy tale. And I think anyone who's really serious about looking at the facts, when they say, like, you know, when people say, ah, you know, man just made it up. 
Uh, that person's speaking ignorantly because if you look into, look into the facts, you know, the Bible is not like Peter says here. He knew back then. We've not followed cunningly devised fables. Right? He, he, they're not, because, they're, because they are not following what they were told. Right? They, are, they are preaching what they saw, what many people saw. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So not only was this said at Jesus' baptism, but where else was it said? And this voice, which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So notice here, James, John and Peter get to go up to the mount with Jesus where he was transfigured. And they saw him transfigured with their own eyes. They heard with their own ears God say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But then he says in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Man, what can be more sure than seeing something with your own eyes and hearing something with your own ears? But yet Peter, who was there, who saw it with his own eyes, which heard God with his own ears, says, hey, even more sure than that is the word of God. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And do you realize what you have? Do you think about what you have when you, you, know, you load it up in your phone, take it for granted that you can just read it whenever you want? These are the words of God that people sometimes would die for just to access, right? And we don't even pick it up and read it. And it's so easy for us to get. That's what happens when you have access to things. You take it for granted. That's why when people don't have something, they desire it. When they have it, they start taking it for granted. But you know what? To whom much is given, much shall be required. So if you have that attitude of having something, taking it for granted, you know, you're losing out on a lot because more is required of you. More is required of us today because of what we have access to. Liberty, efficiency, technology. That ought to, sk that ought to put some fear in your heart to think, man, I've been given so much. And yet, am I doing what I should be? Because one day, I'm going to have to see my works on a foundation. And it's going to be so shameful if there's nothing on there. When it all gets burned up. So what are some practical, just some practical tips. So, I mean, how much, do you, how much to read? I mean, there isn't really any, you know, measure, right? You just read as much as you can. To some people, it's going to be a couple of chapters. Some people, it might be one chapter a day. Some people, it might be a, a book, you know, every now and then. But... You know, there's no real, you know, when you're wondering how much to read, there is no exact amount. You just got to read as much as you can, as often as you can. You know, it's, that's, that's what it's all about. Sometimes the heart of the matter is just a matter of the heart. When it's how much to read, well, how much can you read? This is something that's between you and God. When do you read it? My advice would be to read the Bible when you're most alert. Right? When you're most alert, if, the morning, if you're a morning person and you're most alert, alert, that's when you should be reading the Bible. If you're a night owl and that's where you get more out of it, that's when you read it. If on your lunch break you get more out of it, that's when you read it at a time when you're most alert. Don't read it at a time when you're not alert, when you're prone to falling asleep, if you're distracted. That's why sometimes it's better to read. If you get distracted easily, it's better to read a paper Bible. Why is it? Because when you read a paper Bible, you don't get the notifications popping up. You don't get things distracting you. You're not there where you can just switch apps, start surfing YouTube again, start searching Facebook. So if you struggle to just focus, you know, maybe put it on airplane mode while you're reading. Put it on airplane mode so you're not getting messages, you're not getting notifications, things like maybe turn notifications off. So that when you're reading, you're focused and you can read your bit, you know, your 10, 15 minutes a day or whatever. And then you get that done and then it's, you know, you've, you've read your Bible for the day. 
At least you're constant, consistently doing it. It's always better co to consistently read the Bible than to just like do a long portion, you know, like let's say it's like on the weekend, I'm just going to like, you know, read like a, like a book, you know. One, it's a lot easier to do small steps, right? And, it, and, and another is you don't want to just go long periods of time. You know, because remember, the Word of God should be intertwined into your life. It's not just like I just get this hit and then just, you know, just neglect God for a week and I can't do another hit. Chances are you'll probably forget a lot of the things you've read. And, and you shouldn't have that sort of relationship with God, right? You shouldn't just have a relationship with God where you just, all right, I'll just spend some time with you and then, you know, I'll, get, I'll give God like one hour and then, you know, the rest of the week is just like nothing. <laughs> so consistency is good. How do you read it? My advice is, you know, for a new believer, it's good to start in the New Testament. So for a new believer, just start from Matthew. And it's good to just read through the Bible from beginning to end, rather than just selecting a book and jumping all over the place. Because the Bible is in chronological order. You know, so when you read through it, you're kind of reading through it from beginning to end. If you started in Genesis, you'd read through it, you'd get the stories. You know, so just read through it from beginning to end. If you go through the hard parts, just keep reading. Because you know what? The Bible kind of repeats itself sometimes and sometimes you'll read through a portion and you'll read through it again and you come back and it's like, oh yeah, I remember reading it there. It's kind of explaining it again. And then you read it the second time it starts to become more familiar to you. Don't be worried if you read the Bible. Don't get this idea that you read the Bible and you're just thinking, oh man, it's so hard to understand. Of course, because there's milk and there's strong meat in there. You're not expected to read the Bible the first time and then just think, oh, okay, I've read the Bible once, I just understand everything now. You know, sometimes you talk to people at the door, and they're just like, yeah, I've read, the, I've read the Bible before, and they just think they know everything. Like, no, there's a lot in there, right? You don't get it all the first time. You read through it more and more and more, and the more you read through it, the more familiar you get, get with it. Um, and don't let, people, don't let people make you think that oh, you know, I'm reading through the Bible, it's hard to understand because of the King James English. <laughs> that, 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 I don't, I think that, of course that adds a little bit of difficulty because it may be not a language that you're completely familiar with. But there are, once you learn the, the words that we don't normally wor use, like the F and S endings, what they mean, and the these and the thous, it actually reads quite easy. And that's why people that buy into this whole Oh, you know, you've got to read the modern versions because they're easier to read. Yeah, take them to a hard passage in that easier to read Bible. They're not going to get it either. You know, it's funny. I always tell this story where I was having this argument with somebody between the King James Bible and another Bible. And we were reading through like an Old Testament passage. And I was reading through it and he was hearing the King James English. And he's like, oh, man, ah, it's, it's so hard to understand. So he's like, let's read it in, in my Bible. It's easier to understand. So then he started reading. I think it was Isaiah 14 we were looking at because I was trying to show him how the NIV takes out Lucifer and you know, calls Jesus, you know, calls Lucifer the morning star, where Jesus is the morning star in Revelation. So if you cross-referenced in the NIV, you would actually be cross-referencing Isaiah 14 with Revelation and putting Jesus in Isaiah 14 and saying he's fallen from heaven. So the fact that the King James Bible calls Lucifer Lucifer, leaves that word in and calls him the son of the morning rather than the morning star, then it removes, obviously, that, that incorrect reference between those two verses. So anyways, he's reading through it in his Bible, and he's struggling to read it too, because then he realized, okay, it's not the King James English, it's just that this is a difficult passage, and it's a passage that's harder to understand, and you need to read it a few times to get it. So, if you're a new believer, it's best to start in the New Testament, you know, because, the, you know, it, it is, the New Testament is easier to read than the Old Testament. The Old Testament has books that are a bit more deep and have things that you may not be so familiar with. So I recommend starting in the New Testament, reading from beginning to end, reading the Old Testament from beginning to end. If you struggle, you know, if you're struggling through some of the harder passages, say like in, in Numbers or Leviticus or in some of the prophets, then take a break from it and go back to the New Testament. You know, so it, it's all right if you jump a bit around, but I think if you try your best to just get through it from beginning to end and just go through it, then you're reading the Bible balanced and you're getting all of it. Because what you'll tend to do is if you, like with the right foot and left foot, like I talked about, if you're just picking certain passages, certain books, you'll end up gravitating towards the book you like rather than the books you don't like. But you should really be reading all of it. So that's some just practical advice to you.
Last thing I just want to finish on is this verse. It's Hosea 4. Just particularly want to focus on the beginning part. Now, obviously, this is a passage from Hosea, the minor prophet, to what, uh, the nation, God's people. But we can learn a principle here. He says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So you see how if you have a lack of knowledge, sometimes that can wreck your faith. Because why? Because your faith is in the wrong place. See, if your faith is in God's word, you don't get shocked, right? Because if you know what God's word says and you know what you believe, you're not going to get rocked in your faith. But often people's faith and their knowledge is not rooted in God's word. It's rooted in man's word, in man's opinion of God's word. So ask yourself this, are you following God or are you following man? So how do you know this? Well, do you believe something that you just believe because so-and-so said this? Or do you believe it because you know that's what the scripture says? See, if there is anything that you believe and you don't know the Bible reason for why you believe it, then you're not following God anymore. You're following a man because you believe something just because somebody has said it to you as opposed to going to the source, being that Berean, searching the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. See, that was the proof that the Bereans were following God because they heard the word gladly, but then they made sure, hey, is this what God actually said? Because I want to make sure I'm following God, make sure I, I recognize that these people are teaching what God says. So are you following God or are you following it? Can you support what you believe from the Bible? If you believe something, are you able to say, hey, this is why I believe it? And then the next level above that is, can you defend what you believe? Are you able to understand the relevant passages around that topic so you know, hey, this fits with all of Scripture, not just this one Scripture that I know. That's why it's so important to know the whole Bible so that you, when you take a view on a certain passage, you're taking the whole Bible into account, not just that passage and how it sounds because it's easy to take one passage and neglect the bible this is why people disagree on on how to interpret things but if we take the whole bible into account then it now starts to narrow down those views right because all things need to fit all things need to harmonize all things need to be taken into account so don't be destroyed because of your lack of knowledge make sure you are reading the bible all right let's pray thank you lord for your word thank you that we have it lord so many people die to get it. So many people long for the word. Like we read in Psalm 119, like how David longs for your word, that he can keep them, and Lord, we have them. So help us, Lord, not to only have them, help us to learn them, help us to grow in our knowledge, and Lord, help us to do them. So we pray, Lord, that you'll help us. Because we are weak, we get distracted. I pray, Lord, this is a good reminder to people here to love, to study, and to do your word. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.